Um, I would like to share my screen and just uh, start by giving a short introduction to the center. And then uh, we are going to leave the stage to our main speaker of today. So welcome to um, the Renanui Silicon Valley Center uh, that focuses on education and training for the 21st century. Uh, my name is Dr. Annika Steiber, I'm the director of the center. The center was established in 2020 uh, with uh, support of funding from corporations. So if you are representing a corporation that share the understanding of that management innovation might be more important for changing the world in a climate change uh, or to become more competitive than actually technical innovation, then our center is focusing on that. We are one of the very few in the world I just learned that uh, the Drucker Forum is going to start up a Center for Management Innovation in Vienna as well. That uh, makes it three centers in the world that I know about that are focusing on management innovation. That is how few we are. So if your corporation think that this is important, please reach out to me. Uh, we would welcome more corporations to join our quest and offer you services. The mission is to support business professionals in managing and leading their companies in the new digital and sustainable economy by providing them convenient business education fit for the new economy to a reasonable price. So we believe that it's more important to uh, disseminate the new knowledge in order for us to both have a world to come back to, a sustainable economy, but also to survive in a digital economy. Uh, then maybe try to push up the prices as high as we can. Um, we know that um, we have leading, um, absolutely world leading experts behind us, and we want to share this knowledge with as many as possible around the world. Uh, we offer webinars, certificate business management courses that are conveniently online. Um, they are usually small groups, uh, highly interactive, very skill based. So you can start uh, actually using your skills from day one. Um, I got a, an email from one of our customers, previous customers that just said that he won uh, an award and he used the tools that he learned in, in John Hegel's class um, a half a year ago. So that was that was great for us, of course, and for him. Um, we also use thought leaders. Um, we are not stuck to specific faculties. Uh, even if we have great faculties, we're not stuck to specific faculty as most of our competitors are. Uh, we can use any thought leader in the world that is uh, well established in his or her areas of expertise. Um, and we also do in-person leadership training program uh, here in Silicon Valley. Um, as you might know and understand, um, the management is changing and has drastically changed from the traditional management. We are, in fact, I think we are past the management shift and the management paradigm shift. Some of the new pillars are uh, that we need to go for zero distance to users, not customer focused anymore. That is not enough. We go for zero distance to user, we co-create together with users, we involve the users, we create lifetime users. And notice that I actually avoid the word customer, which is referring to a transaction and one single transaction. We go into towards network organizations that are decentralized, empowered employees, fast moving, agile organizations. We are also moving towards employees becoming entrepreneurs, where the expectation is that every employee should be able to not only uh, do entrepreneurial work, but also to become an entrepreneur if they have the skill and will to do it. We're also moving towards compensation based on true value creation rather than just getting a fixed salary, uh, not related in any way to the true value creation you have done and created for the company or organization. We are moving towards leadership becomes non-linear. A leadership, not only servant leadership, stepping back leadership, coaching leadership, but a leadership that can make sure that we create exponential impact, that we can grow by 20% every year instead of two. And then finally, we're going towards ecosystem for an enterprise without boundaries, 
ecosystem for leverage growth that we will learn from John Hagel today. This webinar is a teaser for a course coming up in November. It will start on November 30th. It will be divided over three weeks in a, in a manageable um, setting as three to four hours every session over three weeks. So you will be able to do this in parallel with full-time work. It should also hopefully be on a convenient time in your time zone. We will have John Hagel as the expert and lead instructor uh, together with uh, experts. Um, we just found out that we will have, have Kevin Nolan, uh, the CEO of G Appliances, that have recently been doing a huge enterprise transformation of its company. And it's right now into its second phase where they go into a become a platform ecosystem company. You will learn firsthand from Kevin Nolan what they're doing, how they're thinking, and why they do it. You will also learn from Dr. Marshall Meyer, which is also an expert, had worked for most Ivy League schools in the US, but also in China, about one of the most extraordinary uh, platform ecosystem approaches in the world, which is uh, the approach of hire in China. And as you might know, the Chinese companies are maybe right now leading in the ecosystem approach. So with that, I would like to um, start and give the floor to um, our guest speaker, expert, lead instructor, and the myth and the legend, and advisor to Fortune 500 companies, advisor to World Economic Forum, advisor to the Global Peter Drucker Forum, and so on and so on, John Hegel. Welcome. And you're muted, John. It's very polite, but we need to unmute. Unmuting would certainly help. I could, uh, since I don't have slides, you have to hear me talk. Um, the focus for the, for the webinar today is on ecosystems. And everybody talks about ecosystems these days in business and other organizational settings. But there's significant potential that hasn't yet been achieved that's the focus of this webinar. And I should say at the outset, I'm gonna talk about this in the context of companies, but I think all the themes and principles that I'm outlining apply to all organizations, governments, universities, non nonprofit foundations, but I'm gonna have my comments targeted to, to the business world, the corporate world. Um, and as context for the perspective, I'm going to give a, a bit of a um, perspective on what I call the big shift that we are in. Uh, I've been doing research for decades on the long-term forces that are reshaping our global economy and society. And I think we're still in the very early stages, even though it's been playing out for a couple of decades, still in the early stages of a big shift that will transform our global economy and society. It, it has many different uh, components to it, but one, one of the results of this big shift is mounting performance pressure on all of us. Uh, it takes the form of intensifying competition on a global scale, accelerating pace of change, things we thought we could count on are no longer there. Uh, extreme uh, disruptive events coming in out of nowhere, leaving us scrambling to figure out what to do. That's a lot of pressure. And there's a natural human reaction to pressure, which is uh, generating a, a sense of fear, an emotion of fear. And that has, while it's understandable, I think it has very limiting uh, consequences to it. It shrinks our time horizons. We don't have the ability or desire to look into the future. Uh, we become very risk averse. We are trust the roads and we desire to tightly control everything so that we can make it through this challenging time. And the result, I think one of the results of this big shift is that we're seeing two trends play out on a global scale. One is verti vertical integration, companies buying suppliers and getting more and more back into the supply chain. Uh, and owning every element of it. 
uh, and or outsourcing for short-term cost reduction. So well, we're under a lot of pressure to deliver uh, quarterly results. Let's outsource to get real cost reduction in the short term. The challenge as we think about the third parties that are coming together around companies is that most of the ecosystems today focus on short-term transactions. They're, it's all about buying and selling a product or service and one-on-one uh, -on -one kinds of relationships. And there may be other uh, parties involved, but it's all with the, the central organizer. And the result is uh, tightly managed supply chains that where we specify the organizer of the supply chain specifies every activity that needs to be done throughout the supply chain and monitors it closely. Now, these have de delivered some results, but I think that there are three levels of opportunity that have yet to be fully addressed. And I'll just start with the first level of opportunity, which I describe as leveraged growth. And what I mean by that is the opportunity to grow more quickly with fewer resources. We're under a lot of pressure for growth as companies, investors are no longer just looking for profits in the quarter, they're looking for evidence of growth. Show me the growth. And in my experience, when corporate leaders talk about growth, they focus on two options, make or buy. Those are the two options. It's just a question of, how much are we going to do organically, internally? How much are we going to do through acquisition in terms of driving growth? But I think we need to shift our focus of growth from cost to value. And that opens up a third path to growth that isn't yet really being pursued aggressively. And it's what I would call, uh, again, leverage growth, but it's the need to, starts with the need to look ahead and to anticipate large emerging unmet needs of customers and other stakeholders. And then finding third parties that have the resources and capability and helping to connect them to that customer to provide more and more value and capturing some of that value for yourself as the organizer. That's an untapped opportunity that I think is very significant. And I'll just give one example. It's not a complete example of what I have in mind for leverage growth, but it was uh, the company, uh, technology company Cisco uh, back in the 1990s. Um, it launched a, a, a website called Cisco Connection Online. And the focus of Cisco Connection Online was to ask, ha have prospects, people who are interested in Cisco products and services, come to a website, answer a few questions, and then based on that, they would start to connect them with third parties that could be helpful to them, in addition to whatever the, their own products and services were. But uh, I, I won't go into the detail, but they ended, Cisco ended up having 40,000, 40, 40,000 business partners as part of this ecosystem, where they were focused on address uh, identifying and addressing unmet customer needs that went well beyond whatever Cisco could provide in its own products and services. And hugely valuable, created very uh, strong relationships with customers as a result of the help that was being provided. So that's one opportunity here is leverage growth. And the second opportunity which has to do with enhancing flexibility and scaling impact. And I think one of the key barriers that we're seeing today in scaling ecosystems is that they're tightly coupled business processes within those ecosystems. As I mentioned before, tightly specifying all the activities that need to be done, having contracts that will guarantee adherence to those, uh, those specifications. And that makes it very hard to scale uh, the number of participants. That's a lot of administrative overhead that's required if we're going to really um, have tightly coupled business processes. I think there's an opportunity 
untapped again, there are some early examples, but largely untapped to shift to what I call loosely coupled business processes that can be much more effectively orchestrated. What I mean by loosely coupled, I mean, instead of tightly specifying every activity in a business process, define modules and focus on specifying what needs to come into the module and then what needs to come out of the module, but leave the, what is at the actions within the module up to the provider and give them the space and opportunity to improvise and innovate in terms of addressing unmet needs, as long as they meet the requirements uh, that of whatever is coming out of the module. So um, as a result, I think those loosely coupled business processes not only can be much more flexible because you can move participants in and out as long as they understand what the interfaces to the module are, but you can also create a seedbed for innovation um, by focusing on end user performance metrics and benchmarking, you can start to see, you know, what are the unmet needs and each participant, because they have the flexibility within their own module, can start to innovate in terms of coming up with better approaches to deliver the value much more effectively uh, to the customers. So I think it's a very powerful way to start to scale these ecosystems and really create much more flexibility and potential for innovation uh, in, in the ecosystem. And again, because of time, I won't go into a lot of detail, but a, a quick example of a Chinese company, Li and Fong. Um, it's a company that uh, serves apparel designers around the world, all the brand names we know, and they help to orchestrate all the activities required to deliver clothing to the retailing centers, wherever in the world they are for these apparel designers. And they have uh, 15,000 business partners in their global ecosystem covering over 40 countries. So even though they're a Chinese company, they are truly global, 40 countries their participants are active in. Um, now, again, I won't go into the details, but Li and Fung grew more than tenfold in the 1990s. It grew to $4 billion in revenue, and it ended up generating over $1 million per employee in revenue, and an overall return on equity of anywhere between 30 to 50%. Hugely successful because they embraced these loosely coupled business processes. They were focused on defining the interfaces and leaving it up to the participants to figure out how to deliver within the, within the module. And uh, again, very successful as a result. And I think the success has been, is balanced by the growing challenges that have been experienced by the company in the last two decades, when it started to shift back to an acquisition-driven growth strategy. It started to acquire some of the participants and started to vertically integrate into some of the areas of the network. And the result was the ecosystem participants began to become lose trust. You know, when is when is Liam Fung going to compete with me? In any event, that's but I think it's an interesting example of loosely coupled business processes operating on a global scale. Now, third level of opportunity. This is to really accelerate and expand impact. And this is moving from static ecosystems to dynamic ecosystems. As I mentioned, the static ecosystems are really just buy and sell kinds of activities. Uh, you know what you're get, gonna get and you just need to get a transaction to get it. Dynamic ecosystems is where the commitment is for all the participants to evolve very rapidly, learn more about what they can, how they can deliver more and more value. And um, that requires the development of something that I call learning platforms. Again, I won't go into detail here, but it's a very different form of platform from the ones that we know and love today. And it's the focus is on learning. And here to clarify, when I talk about learning, I'm not talking about um, learning in the form of sharing existing knowledge, training programs. I'm talking about learning in the form of creating entirely new knowledge 
that never existed before. And I think there's an opportunity in dynamic ecosystems, again, as you get more and more participants focused on that form of learning, delivering more and more value uh, uh, through learning on, on how to do that, you get uh, significant value creation, exponential value creation. So um, the learning ultimately goes exponential through network effects. And it also helps, I, I just quickly mentioned that it, it needs learning uh, ecosystems or dynamic ecosystems can be very powerful in helping participants to move beyond fear to much more excitement and passion about the opportunity to learn together and see the results. Again, just a very quick example of this third level of opportunity, this notion of dynamic ecosystems. Um, it's in the Chinese motorcycle industry. And this is, goes back to, the, again, the mid-1990s in a city in China, Chongqing, where there were a series of entrepreneurial companies that came together, uh, Zhongshan, Longshan, Dachangjiang. Um, these were companies that saw an opportunity in the motorcycle industry to challenge the leaders the global in the global motorcycle industry. The leaders at this point were largely in the um, in the uh, in Japan. Uh, but it, it, what they did was they created the ecosystems where they modularized the design of the motorcycle. And um, I think there's some oh, okay. Uh, they modularized the design of the motorcycle and they created, um, uh, invited lots of participants from different technology areas to come in and innovate around the motorcycle, design of the motorcycle. Long story short, the average export price of a motorcycle uh, from China dropped from $700 in the late 1990s to less than $200 in 2002. Very short period, significant drop, and it created a significant increase in market share relative to the Japanese. So just one example of the kind of potential for these dynamic ecosystems. So I just want to come quickly back to the uh, to wrap up in terms of the, uh, the big shift that I started with. I mentioned that one of the consequences of the big shift was creating mounting performance pressure. <clears throat> I believe that at the same time, these long-term forces are creating exponentially expanding opportunity. We can create much more value with far less resource, far more quickly than was ever imaginable before. But in order to do that, we have to really understand the potential of dynamic ecosystems and take action to mobilize them and participate in them and I believe exponential value will be created as a result. So let me stop there and just see, uh, I believe Aniki had some questions you wanted to talk through. Great, thank you. Um, so we were planning uh, a Q&A um, <clears throat> so everyone can get their, um, their voice heard and ask your question to John Hagel. Before we start that, I would like to just ask you, uh, John, um, you are coming up with a course in November. Who, who should attend that course and, and why why should they do that course? <clears throat> wow. Uh, you know, I think virtually everyone should attend the course in the sense that, I, and I, again, I'm going to focus more on companies, but I think this applies to all organizations, large organizations that are seeking to create more value for their customers. Um, but, you know, certainly leaders at the top of the organization uh, could find this very relevant. But I think it can be uh, very relevant at the department level or even the in level of individuals. At the department level, if, if you're in product development, procurement, sales, or even administrative functions like HR, mm -hmm. there's a big opportunity to start to reach out and connect and create these dynamic ecosystems to accelerate learning and, and value delivery uh, for your stakeholders. Mm. And then at the level of individuals, even if it's you, you just you as an individual and the company or organization isn't interested or 
receptive for you as individuals to find ways to participate in learning ecosystems uh, will help you to develop your skills and insights and learning much more rapidly than if you just stay isolated within your department, within your organization. So I think it can be relevant for everyone. So we we got feedback uh, from from previous course participants that they could actually apply this from day one in the organization, and they even won a national award now by by using the tools. Um, do you, do you think you dare to to promise them that they can actually apply this when they're coming back to the office? <laughs> well, I, I certainly am not going to suggest it's easy and it, it happens overnight. I, but I, one of the key themes in the work that I've done is this notion of small moves smartly made can set big things in motion. So I think no matter where you are in the organization, there are opportunities to start with some small moves that can demonstrate the potential and convince more and more people to participate. So I believe that everyone can uh, uh, expect to have impact as a result of what they learn in the course. Final question to me. Uh, we have a lot of people that are relearning and retrained right now because we are in this shift so talents need to to you know re-educate themselves or to just keep keep being relevant on the market i mean i feel that every day myself that you know how will i be relevant i need to update myself on all the newest things um do you think that this course could also be used to boost your cv so i can will i get any you know certificate or anything i can i can boost my cv and say i actually have more advanced management skills than than what you can go do and learn from most MBAs out there? Yeah, no, I, you certainly get a certificate from uh, Menlo College and having completed the course. And I think it, it can be a significant indicator to potential uh, people you might be interested in working for that, that you not only have learned something, you've learned something on the leading edge of management and business performance. And right. that could significantly increase the attractiveness and desire to bring you in. Okay, so with that, um, we have Isaac with us as well that can help us now to identify questions. Um, so Isaac, can you give some instructions to everyone, everyone that want to um, to ask a question to John Hagel directly? How should they do it? trying to apply point solutions to complex system problems. Yeah, no, it's a good question for sure. I think that um, in, in my experience, the, the best way to do this is to, first of all, focus on how the world is changing and the increasing uncertainty and accelerating pace of change that makes it necessary to be much more flexible and to learn faster so that being clear the world is changing it's not the world that we were in when we built a successful company it's changing and we need to change with it but then it's also being very focused on as i mentioned this notion of small moves smartly made it's how can you start with some very specific actions that can demonstrate it's you only need you know two or three other participants uh, in an ecosystem to begin the process. But you can start to show how they are coming up with new ways of creating and delivering value. And that starts to overcome the skepticism or resistance of the more traditional leaders who just want to continue doing what they've done in the past. And uh, I think a, a big thing that it will quickly show is the, the capability of flexibility that these participants can rapidly change their activities based on changing circumstances. And that's key to uh, addressing the uncertainty in our environments. Um, yeah, we have from Marshall, Kurt, Patrick, John, given that most people are accustomed to focusing on performing one functional task at a time, alienated from responsibilities around a project, 
what are some steps we can take to help Collaborator shift into a learning mode? Right. Yeah. Um, again, I don't want to suggest this is easy. It's it's very challenging because people are so tightly wedded to the approach that led to success in the past. And so, um, but I think it's a it's the showing taking some examples where we can show how connected everything is that you cannot just isolate and build a wall uh, around one particular set of activities that those activities are interacting with many others and other activities are interacting with them and showing through examples where this occurs and how some unexpected changes in those activities perhaps in an area you never expected are, are limiting your ability to do the activities within the silo that you've created. And so I think it's going to, to for examples like that. And again, ideally starting to show some initiatives where you can show the connection and how by leveraging the connection. I mean, the connection at one level can be viewed as a, a bad thing. You know, everything's connected. I don't have control anymore. On the other side, all this connection can lead to significant leverage. You can create much more value if you understand how everything is connected and help to drive certain forms of value to be delivered into the marketplace. So I think that that's the, the good news part of the story is, is this is not just about addressing a challenge that we have today in a rapidly changing world. It's about an opportunity to create and deliver much more value to our stakeholders. And if I may comment on that, on on um, in the course in November and December, uh, we're going to, as I said, present uh, the case of hire. And what is extremely interesting is that they have a scorecard uh, where they are measuring the uh, self evolution of ecosystem, uh, where they have uh, a tool, a method. Um, and that they use, uh, all ecosystem partners are using that in order to self-identify gaps that uh, are uh, sort of hindering them from reach the, the goals, but also to identify uh, constantly new uh, user value that they need to bring in, seize and, and leverage on. So they, they self-evolve uh, to a higher and higher level of value contribution to users, but also make sure that they have this kind of coordination and self-control within the ecosystem to reach uh, set targets all the time. Um, and we will go through that uh, as part of the, the case of hire, if you're interested. Um, I don't know any kind of methodology like that in the world except that one. So that could be of interest for, for you that asked that question. Um, okay, so Isaac, do you have any any other questions there identified mm -hmm. by we have someone? Two more. Oh yeah. Uh, hi John, do you think that serendipity could play a key role on dynamic ecosystems developments from Inma? Mm. Oh boy, uh, <laughs> you're tapping into a uh, a uh, an area that's very dear to me and that I've uh, explored quite a bit on serendipity. Uh, I, you know, one of my key themes in serendipity and serendipity is basically luck. It's, you know, the unexpected encounters that make, that create value that you didn't have before. And most people tend to view serendipity as, as just, it happens when it happens and all you can do is be prepared for it and uh, take advantage of the insights that come to, come to you as a result of the serendipity. I believe, and I've written extensively about this, you can go online to, to find it, but I believe that there's an opportunity to shape serendipity, to significantly increase the likelihood of those unexpected encounters. And it takes many different forms, but I think in the context of ecosystems and um, uh, the theme that we're talking about today, one of the key ways that serendipity can be shaped in these ecosystems is by asking really inspiring questions so that you go out to the ecosystem and say, you know, what if we could do this? 
and what could we accomplish in terms of value to the stakeholders and acknowledging you don't know the answer and asking for help from the ecosystem participants. So I think that's one of the areas where serendipity can become very uh, powerful and frequent is when, you, when you're asking really powerful questions and inviting people that you didn't really know had any insights or answers to it um, to contribute. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm a big proponent that ecosystems Again, dynamic ecosystems. <laughs> In the static ecosystems, it's just tell me the price and I'll pay the price or whatever. Uh, no, in dynamic ecosystems, it's about this passion for learning and asking really powerful questions that open people up to say, let's contribute. Mm. Uh, if I may, Isaac, I, I would like to take up a, a question from Dennis Kennedy uh, because it's very close to my own heart and interest. Uh, what are good approaches to convince decision makers to think in terms of ecosystems? Um, and this is uh, this is so relevant. Um, right now, we are trying to approach uh, board of directors, uh, not only CEOs and executive but board of directors, because they usually are not trained in this mindset or how to create and how to govern uh, ecosystem. Um, and I think in the course, when you will meet Kevin Nolan from GA, he will go into exactly this question. Why did they start going into an ecosystem phase? Because their first phase was all about, you know, uh, making their own organization more entrepreneurial, and fast moving, agile and adaptable. And now in the second phase, they're all about focusing on ecosystem. And I think actually they will send a bunch of people uh, to the course uh, as well. So if you want to learn how uh, a decision maker is thinking and what you and we could do in order to, um, you know, make more decision maker understand the importance of this, um, I think the, the speech and the lecture of Kevin Nolan from Kevin Nolan will be key here. I, I would just like to add on this that, um... As an optimist, I believe that the, some of the uh, disruptions we're going through on a global scale right now in global supply chains, it could be a, a powerful catalyst to get leaders to think more broadly and deeply about ecosystems in the sense that right now the response of many leaders is just, oh, uh, our supply chain broke. We need to find another supplier who is more reliable and put them in that supply chain and tightly specify every activity, everything that needs to be done. Versus pulling back and asking the more fundamental question is, do we really need supply chains? Think about the term, chain is rigid, it's hard to, hard to change. What about if we went from supply chains to supply networks? Where again, with loosely coupled business processes, we could more easily and flexibly tap into a broader range of participants on an as needed basis and learn in the process through the learning uh, dynamic ecosystem perspective. So I think that my hope is that the, a lot of the challenges that we're encountering today around the world um, with the pandemic and other disruptions is something that could be a, a catalyst for leaders to start to question the basic assumptions about how they organize third parties. Um, Isaac, you might have seen this as well, the question from Marshall uh, Kirkpatrick, um, which is also extremely relevant that we tend to, um, to focus on functional task uh, at one at a time, uh, rather than seeing sort of the, the larger strategic metacognition, as you mentioned it, around the project. What are some steps we can take to help collaborators shift into learning mode. Um, again, um, um, I, I think we will touch on that as well uh, in the GEA case for sure, uh, where they went from very silo oriented um, way of working into um, a much more collaborative style where they look at the, the, the full picture, holistic picture towards the market um, the whole time. Um, both in their own organization within, but even more so now in their their ecosystem, working with external partners on the market. A new question is from Aditya. 
are there any best practices developed so far and how these dynamic or open innovation ecosystems can help move the ESG need needle forward as well? Um, so in terms of how to help move the ESG needle forward as well, I think, it, it, again, it's a, a question of thinking more holistically about the environment you're in and the values of the participants you're serving, the stakeholders. And increasingly, ESG is becoming a significant uh, requirement on the part of uh, the, the stakeholders you're serving. And if you can't demonstrate your ability to address the ESG needs uh, in a practical and, and valuable way, you're going to be sidelined. So I think it's it's much more focusing on, um, first of all, the, the changing values of the stakeholders, but then also the opportunity to really be much more active in, in moving in a different direction with ESG by finding third parties that can help you to do that. That again, it's not just all on you and I, I have to do this myself with no help. It's no, where and how can I get third parties to help me in becoming more ESG observant and uh, in all my activities and uh, deliver that to the marketplace. Oh, one more. Marshall just asked another question. Mm -hmm. John, what's your latest thinking on climate change mitigation and adaptation in particular? Anything you can share? Wow. <laughs> uh, the, there's a whole other webinar or even course, so I'm not sure I can uh, go into too much detail here. But I, I would say that um, one of my um, concerns about the climate change movement is that it is driven by what I would call a threat-based narrative. The climate is changing, the world's gonna collapse, we're all gonna die, we need to change. It's all about the threat, the terrible threat, and we're gonna die if we don't change. And as I mentioned at the outset of my talk, one of the biggest concerns I have is the growth of fear in all participants. And the, the limiting effects that fear has in terms of shrinking time horizons, losing trust in others. I don't think that focusing on threat is the best way to address climate change. I think the best way to address climate change is by framing a really inspiring opportunity. What kind of flourishing world could we create, not just for ourselves, but for all animals, all plants, the entire planet, what amazing flourishing world could we create? And then using questions as a way to drive learning because people haven't really focused on that, that opportunity. But if you ask the right questions and can show through short-term action, real results and impact, now people start to get really interested and excited. Wow, this is amazing. Yes, we are starting to have impact. How can we have even more impact? But, and it's overcoming the fear. It's getting people to be really passionate and excited about the world that we could create but is not yet there. Mm -hmm. Yes, and uh, there are so many things. Uh, that is why I, I talked about the responsible uh, or the uh, the sustainable world uh, before, that we have talked a lot about management innovation for the digital era, but I think it will be more and more now uh, management innovation for survival and um, in, the, in the climate change and to create a sustainable uh, environment and world. So I'll just thank be, you. I'll be a bit contrarian on that because, again, I, I, I view sustainability and there are all kinds of other terms like circular economy, um, uh, regeneration. Those are very static concepts. Yeah. Sustainable? We just want to sustain what we have. Yeah. Why? Why don't we want to achieve even more value for everyone? Let's do it together. And I think, again, to me, it's more a question of flourishing and growth, but growth that is, is going to help all of us to thrive in a much better way than we have in the past versus just sustaining what we have or circular activity that repeats itself 
endlessly. Anyway, I'm sorry, I'm a bit, bit contrarian on that one, but uh, I think there's a big opportunity out there that needs to be addressed. No, but I think you're right. I think you're totally right. We need the dynamic ecosystem approach, definitely also for for uh, the climate change, um, uh, you know, yeah, uh, yeah threat and uh, challenge. So by that, um, it's 8.50. Thank you everyone for joining us. Um, I can see I, I can see your passion and your engagement. You're still here with us. Um, I hope that we will see you again uh, and we can continue the discussion in November. Um, I hope it will be a very diverse group of people uh, from all kinds of levels, from all kinds of industries uh, and where we can learn from each other and we can also learn from some uh, leading uh, thoughts and practices in the world. So thank you for, for being with us today. Um, have a great weekend coming up and take care and look uh, up for new events from us, uh, free webinars or courses. And of course, if your company would like to fund a center like this and to do specific research and to, um, to set up potentially specific collaboration between uh, partners, uh, let me know. Send out an email to me.